The darkness. The vast of night. Luke, I am your father. <laughs> the cosmological the chasm. The dark side. <laughs> the cosmological chasm. Yeah. <laughs> chasm. 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 <laughs> I, always said, I always said chasm. I My think name's it's chasm, Chad, though. Like Chad Chasm. Oh, like yeah. A, like if your name's that. Chad and you have yeah. a polo, a Ralph Lauren polo <laughs> shirt on, you're kind of done. <laughs> it's over. Blonde hair. <laughs> it's over at that point. <laughs> no one likes a out, Chad. I hang out on the outer banks. <laughs> kind of the same thing this whole 2020 with Karen, you know. Oh, uh, yeah. It's the, Watching the, those crazy racist ladies. The, the ebb and flow <laughs> of society, you know. Blah, 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 blah. And speaking of that, people getting shit wrong. <laughs> Let's talk about when physics gets it wrong. Okay. Ooh, wow. When physics gets it wrong. So how could I ever make such an absolute let's, uh, claim? We, we're going to get into that. Uh, well, somebody made a claim and did something, but mm-hmm. let, let's kind of back up, back up the bus. Yeah. And then let's get into uh, gravitational waves and the existence of that. It, this happened in February 2016, and we found that there's ripples in space and time. Yeah. Produced by massive black holes. And I want to know where these black, every universe has black holes. I want to know where they come from. Why are they there? Why are they in the middle of the universe? Is it just so much mass pulling into itself? Wouldn't a star form? And then, oh, wait a minute, my black hole, did that come from a dead star? Yeah, Einstein predicted these 100 years ago, but we actually saw them and discovered them. Uh, you know, so how many people have predicted things, but we didn't have the technology to show that it actually isn't existed? that wild? Yeah, he's not the only one, he's just well cited. Yeah, and I think, um, and this was in uh, 2012. Since the mid 1960s, physicists have uh, positioned that a fundamental particle ought to exist that would complete the standard model of particle physics. Since 19, for 60 years, mm-hmm. they've been looking for something to answer it all. The roadmap to the subatomic world. Yeah. Uh, now that we're atomic, we figured out the atomic bomb, we got to go subatomic. The Higgs would explain why leptons, another fundamental particle, have mass. Mm-hmm. A machine consisting of billions of dollars, the large. Large Arch, Hadron Collider. Right. Um, which is in Gene- near Geneva, Switzerland. Isn't this CERN? Is yes, the Large yes. Hadron Collider yeah, yeah, in CERN? Yeah. Yeah. Yep, CERN. These discoveries share a common theme. They suggest that fundamental physics is on a roll and that the foundational theories submitted by the end of the 1970s are perfectly consistent with the data we're now seeing. Okay. What do you mean physics is on a roll? You created a giant circular tube to smash stuff together <laughs> here, Why? once again here's right. humans we just had a concrete about smashing stuff i don't understand why are we mario brothers with nature that's all we are <laughs> yeah all the time you know that's just a really good comment shit. why is it that we feel like we need to destroy things to move forward yeah i don't i've never understood what that. is with that i don't get it why what is with that nature of us needing to destroy or just like curb nature to bend to our will so that we can progress. Well, th- this article, the, the this is on aon.com, great, aon.co. Co. Uh, the, the, the writer says this, but I'm not being entirely honest when I say everything is working out so well. It's not working out well. While physicists have been busily <laughs> verifying ideas devised in the past century, we've made almost no progress in figuring out where to go in this one. It's been 60 years. <laughs> what are you doing for 60 years? Material, like 99% of our universe is stuff you can't see. Mm-hmm. And we're looking at 1%, maybe less. And thinking we're badass. And thinking we're badass. And we've had, we have the solve. We have the answer for all yeah, of it. Yeah, exactly. That's like, I've, I have the ocean on earth. I've taken out one droplet of water. One. I'm going to study and say, all of the fundamental rules of the universe and everything sits right here in this one drop because I can see it. Well, I don't want to get to... To what? Uh, but the whole idea, this is where science pisses me off. This whole idea where you have to be sterile and separate and wear yeah, a lab coat yeah, and yes, have yes. a have an ape in a cage separate and you got to wear gloves and everything. Mm-hmm. It's like you won't understand things till you have a relationship with them. Wow. Big difference. When it, whenever you, if you understood 0.001% of mm-hmm. your fiance, yep. and you just focused on getting really, really, really good at loving her at the 0.001%. How she clips her toenails. Yeah, how she clips her I toenails. And then, and then you learn and you watch it and you get exactly perfect. Of, and you can, to the T, you can like clip her toenails absolutely amazingly Precise and accurate. But then define her for who she is by how she clips her toenails. (laughs) Yes. And and then how you can clip her toenails better. Yeah. 
You know what I'm saying? And she can I know it. who you are as a human being, judging by how you clip your toenails. <laughs> and I can tell you right now, I can do it better, and that makes you lesser than me. Yeah. And I'm going to create mm-hmm. a whole theory on your fiance based off of her clipping her toenails. On toenail clipping. So I'm, I'm going to create these she's... abstract <laughs> ideas and say, well, you cross <laughs> over with your right hand to yeah. your left foot. What does that say about your uh, psychological state? Yes, yeah, exactly. Are you kidding me? We are focusing on how people like do this. And oh, wait a minute. It's not just the action, Jason. Now we got to study the toenail, <laughs> the clipping it's, itself. Yeah, and 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 the precise tool that you use. Yeah, I need to spend billions of dollars, and I need to smash toenails together in this giant ring in Switzerland because <laughs> I need a black hole of toenails. Yeah, yeah. I need to understand the God particle <laughs> that fl- sits in there also sits in the toenail. Yeah, and the article says this, this is funny. In fact, we are at a complete loss at how to explain some of the most fundamental but baffling observation of how our universe behaves. Thank you. Because we don't have a relationship with the universe. We have no relationship with nature. You don't understand how something behaves until you have a relationship with it. How, you know what this reminds me of with data? Let me tell you. I don't understand how people behave because I have no real objective evidence of it. I don't have a relationship with those people. So I need to assume that in some sort of statistical likelihood of my abstract mathematics, that this is how people will act. And with great theoretical probability of my math, I can say that that person has a 70% chance of taking a left turn and buying that purse. Right. What? Are you kidding me? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to sit here across the table. I'm going to put that person on a microphone. And I'm going to ask them what they're going to do. I'm going to ask them how they think. I'm going to have a relationship with that human being. I'm going to have a relationship with nature because that's what a human being is. We are nature. We're bound by it. All of our particles sit within it. Why is it that we're coming up with all of these ideas that lack any sort of evidence whatsoever, and then we synthesize this idea and then try and apply it to everything? And like Jung said, you statistically flatten the value of what it means to be a human being. If we're doing that with humans, Mm. we're going to do it with science. And if Mm. we do it with science in the material sense, we're doing that with nature. And if you flatten nature, then what is left? Is there anything special about it? Or do you say that my subatomic particles and my lepers, or I don't even know what the heck the thing was called. Yeah, there, there's a certain physicist. I won't mention his name. Thank you for stopping me. I was on a rant. <laughs> there's a certain physicist. Well, this is just going to back what you said. There's a certain physicist that said this, and it's in the article, aon.co. You can look at this. Uh, he said, when you don't have data to help you, and he was advising his colleagues to get creative, pretend that there are experiments and calculate. He said this in the 1950s at a time when there are few observations or probably constraints on the theory of general relativity. So here's the situation when you don't have enough data. So let, let's get creative and, and be in the lab and just make up some abstract ideas and then run tests off those abstract ideas. And then after we've done that, let's get some math to support it. <laughs> so can you, cause you've shared this with me and I think it's really interesting and people need to understand this. Can you explain the ant, the trunk and the limb? I think this is a great analogy to do this. The grand metaphor for life. <laughs> yes. I let's look let's pretend that these theoretical physicists are an ant on the trunk of a tree. They're on the bottom. They're albeit quite small in terms of scale relative to the size of the tree. They also do not have the ability to look very far ahead of them. The distance in sense of scale you know, an inch might look like a mile, right? So as I'm climbing up this trunk, all right, how would I know if I've kind of tapered off onto a branch? Mm. You know, what I thought I was seeing in my limited view, limited perspective of reality, that, oh, I found something. This is interesting. Let me continue to follow it. And what I found that because I can't see far ahead, I've gone down off of this branch on the tree. And then through that, that branch begins to split off some more. And I'm, I'm walking as an ant, and I think I got it all made for myself. And then I'm like, oh, you know, this, this must be a law. Because I found a, a law that I thought was fundamental. Well, let me go test it. Oh, I've hit a branch. Okay, and so here's the testing happening. And then as that splits more and I travel further and further down, I still think that I am on the trunk of the tree. Mm-hmm. The actual foundational truth of this creation or universe that we're sitting in, right, of nature, 
And what I do is I say, okay, if I think I'm here, but I'm not because I'm so far out and I have a limited view site, yes. I'm going to start to create math that fundamentally supports me being out on this branch. <laughs> and because I am on some sort of derivative of the truth, I need to explain that and say, I'm going to take the derivative and have it define the truth for everything else. And when I'm out there, I'm going to use abstract mathematics and statistics to say, this is fundamentally the truth of the universe. And I'm going to keep dividing things down from atoms to subatomic particles to string theory and all that other stuff, which I have no fundamental proof of it being existing. But theoretically, my math can show that it must be there. Well, sure it does. And you will spend all of your time completely lost on that branch and further away from the trunk of the tree where the real knowledge actually sits. And you think that the thing on the branch defines what happens on the trunk. Well, guess what? All that energy, all that force of life and nature sits here in the trunk, which feeds the branch. And last I checked, trees are self-pruning. So what happens when it decides to drop that branch? What are you left with when you thought it was a fundamental truth? But in theory, strictly in theory, you were just working on something that was so abstract that you tried to prove it and you were so lost because the shift of your perspective was not actually where it needed to be. Yeah, I think you can see that. I mean, it, we've talked about this before, but I mean, you can go hiking, you know, and you you get um, one small degree off yeah. and then you hike for five miles and see where you're at. <laughs> That's correct. So if you don't have a fundamental guidance of these things, you're going to go down a rabbit hole, but that rabbit hole will never define the real nature of the universe. So, so you're saying we have to shift our perspective? I'm saying we need to go back. Go back to the basics. If you cannot explain the basics, if you cannot explain the universe simply mm. and clearly, you fundamentally do not understand it. If it requires abstract math to prove a point, you fundamentally do not understand creation as a whole. You do not understand nature. Nature does not want to be complex. It looks complex because it's an interconnected web of simplicities. And because we lack an idea of simplicity, we create complexity and then web that out. Yeah, complexity comes from not understanding. That's precisely I mean, I mean, correct. Yeah, I mean, you can see that, you know, in any system. I'm that not. is, I mean, uh, we, we all love the anti-fragile book. Yeah. Um, he, he talks about that very specifically. He's like, when it, so something that's anti-fragile can, hand, can, it needs the storms. If the storm doesn't break it, it just becomes stronger. Yeah. So, you know, it's the same with the tree. You know, if you have no wind, you know, they say to take your house plants and shake them, you know, and do different things like that. To but why are you doing that? <laughs> yeah. You're not being abusive to a house plant. You're actually strengthening it. Yeah. You're, you're keep, you're removing it from this artificial sterile environment because mm -hmm. it's in your house. That's where yeah. your house is. And you're trying to reenact nature. Mm -hmm. Okay. It doesn't matter if it's theoretical physicists or a world-class and they define that for themselves, marketing firm or a Fortune 500 company. The way you've been looking at data or the universe is in the aspect of a theoretical physicist. Mm. You are creating these ideas and tools and algorithms and synthesized data sets to say that this is how the world works. You have fundamentally eradicated the individual aspects of nature that make it beautiful, that make human beings beautiful, and you coin us all to be exactly the same because you do not want to take the time to have a relationship with these things. You want to take the conservative approach and assume everything is the same. You want to polarize the world in that direction. And when you've done that, you've eradicated creativity. You've eradicated the evolution of your mind, society, states, nations, and yourself. Because what happens when you begin to build a relationship I mean, I don't want to get too, but I mean, like if you begin to build a relationship with nature mm -hmm. instead of pulverizing it and Mario brothering it, you know, and smashing everything yeah. and you begin to build a relationship with it and it was a symbiotic relationship where there was give and take, taking, you know, yeah. back and forth. What begins to happen with these systems that we've built? You know, I mean, th that's the fear of man is that we've, we've crushed our way to this ape like comfortable society that we built that is wrong. Yep. And now we're at this point to where we are becoming more self-aware and it's like the planet's not sustainable to what we've done. 
And how are we going to change it? But that, that's the question. But I thought all of our technology and all of the evolution of our policy as nations have grown so much. We've advanced. All you've done is you have taken aggressive view against nature. You have destroyed it to put down parking lots everywhere and to find a border around that parking lot. You've done it to human beings. And what you have lacked the realization of is that you are crippling the thing that supports you in your own life. You taking those actions and thinking you're great is only a reflection of your lack of understanding of who you are and your understanding of others. So to wrap this up, Tartle.co. I don't want to wrap this up. I want to talk about this for another hour. <laughs> Tartle.co. I, I want to I use, um, I'm going to kind of shift in our big seven and use human rights. Because we're talking about the planet, I can, it would be easy to get into climate stability, but a person taking 100% responsibility for the planet, a person taking 100% responsibility for another human, mm -hmm. you know, these are these are that relationship. These are things that can change, you know, I, I hate to use this word, but our paradigm of what we view, um, you know, of what has been happening, not what we view, but what has actually been happening. How does Tardo play a role in human rights when it comes to a, our symbiotic relationship with nature? We did not create a tool that synthesizes an understanding. It's not some sort of fake theoretical idea. We created a tool that brings two human parties together and asks them to find understanding amongst themselves. And through that understanding, there is a gain that is achieved. One is knowledge and one is in the economic sense. And then from that, when you understand somebody else as much as you can understand yourself and that relationship in between, you have begun to evolve. You respect the rights of those people. And what you realize is that all these false ideas that you thought made us different, those drift away. Those branches fall off the tree, those false ideas. And you begin to respect the rights of that human being because they are a human being. And then from that, not only are you going to them and building that relationship, but you can also ask them to come back around full circle and put those earnings towards things that matter for the protection of those human rights, for a deeper understanding of those human rights. Because when we understand one another, we can find simplicity in life. We can get rid of the chaos. We can get rid of this ideology of making nature bend to our will or other human beings bend to our will. We can respect them for the individuals that they are in this complex system of an interconnected web built on simplicities. So Tartle.co, um, if we wanted to help climate stability, human rights, how would you do that? You go to turtle.co, you sign up, you share your data, you get paid, and you donate it to earning uh, to charities you care about. 